I am so glad you're here today because we're diving into the fascinating world of carboxylic acid derivatives like anhydrides, esters, amides, etc. These compounds play a crucial role in organic synthesis, so we're going to be learning all about how to identify them, how to name them, and also their reactivity. And make sure to stick around to the end because I have some practice problems that should help for your next exam. First, let's break down the main classes of carboxylic acid derivatives. On the screen, you see that we have acid halides. Specifically, the example shown is going to be an acid chloride. Anytime you have two carbonyl groups flanking either side of a center oxygen atom, this is called an anhydride. So again, that's going to be a carbonyl group on either side of this center oxygen. On this side, we have what's called an ester. So an ester is different from an anhydride in that it could, does contain that carbonyl group and a bond to oxygen. However, on the other side of the oxygen is just another alkyl chain or a carbon chain. And then finally, importantly, for especially for those interested in biomolecules and biochemistry, are what are called amide bonds, where you have a carbonyl functional group attached to an amine. Each class of compounds contains a unique structure which contributes to its reactivity in organic chemistry. Additionally, another class of carboxylic acid derivatives which looks a little bit different is going to be the nitrile group. So the nitrile group is also a carboxylic acid derivative even though it doesn't contain a carbonyl functional group and instead contains a carbon with three bonds to nitrogen. And the reason that it's still classified as a carboxylic acid derivative is because it's a carbon with three bonds to a heteroatom. A heteroatom is a non-carbon atom. So if you notice, this carbon has two bonds to an oxygen and one bond to a chlorine. Similarly, this carbonyl group has two bonds to an oxygen and another bond to an oxygen, so a total of three. It's true for all of these and notice that a nitrile contains a carbon with three bonds to nitrogen still satisfying that rule. Let's begin our nomenclature discussion with acid halides. Just like with carboxylic acids, we prioritize the carboxyl group of the functional group and name the other substituents accordingly. So in the case of acetic acid, this actually can become in the, an acid halide. So if we were to replace the OH group into a BR, this would become acetyl bromide. So again, we are changing the ending from ic acid to eel or yl followed by the halide name. So acetic acid becomes acetyl bromide. Benzoic acid, if it becomes an acid halide, so in this case I will use a acid chloride. So this now has become from benzoic acid to benzoyl chloride. So again, benzoic acid becomes benzoyl chloride because I changed the ic ending into eel on each of these. Similarly, cyclohexane carboxylic acid, if it is to become an acid chloride, the name simply changes to cyclohexane carbonyl chloride. So again, we're changing the ilic acid into eel chloride. Naming anhydrides is incredibly straightforward. In fact, you just change the ending from acid to anhydride. So if we are to draw the anhydride version of acetic acid, it is symmetrical on both sides, contains the two carbonyl groups with an oxygen in the center, and its name becomes acetic anhydride. And similarly, this can also be extended to carboxylic acids that are contain common names, like succinic acid, which is drawn here, which contains two carbons in between two identical carboxylic acids. So if we were to draw the anhydride version of this, it's actually a five-membered ring with oxygen at the center. And this becomes from succinic acid to just succinic anhydride. So again, we're just changing the acid name to anhydride. For esters, it's a little more involved. So for example, let's say that we turned acetic acid into an ester. So what we have done is now on the oxygen, instead of there being a hydrogen, there is now an ethyl group. So when naming esters, the alkyl chain that is on attached to the single oxygen atom that has now become effectively like an ether, but it's actually an ester if you consider both pieces of this, then we name this alkyl chain first. So we name the alkyl chain and we actually change the acid and the ic ending to ATE. So acetic acid will become acetate. So let's name this one. So for example, this is an ethyl group. So we will call this ethyl acetate. Again, we name the alkyl chain coming off the oxygen that has been added, and then we change the ic acid ending to ATE. So another example of this, let's say we were to place two methyl groups on this, on each side 
of this malonic acid, which again is the common name accepted. So now we've attached two different methyl groups on either side of those oxygens. So we will call this dimethyl. And again, we're changing the ic acid ending to A-T-E. So this becomes dimethyl malinate. So again, you name the alkyl chain first, you change the ic acid ending to A-T-E, and that's how we get ethyl acetate and dimethyl malinate. And then lastly for nitriles, it's actually also very straightforward. So remember a nitrile is that carbon with a triple bond to nitrogen. We actually remove the acid name and the ic portion as well, and we change it into O-nitrile. So for example, acetic acid, becomes acetonitrile. And similarly, for something like benzoic acid, we're removing the ic and the acid portion. And when we turn this into a nitrile, remember it's a carbon triple bond to a nitrogen, this becomes benzonitrile. So again, we're changing the ic ending into O nitrile. Let's talk a little about the reactivity of the different carboxylic acid derivatives. Each class exhibits distinct reactivity due to things like whether or not there's a good leaving group, whether or not there are lone pairs that can contribute to resonance stabilized forms of these molecules. Additionally, we also need to consider the steric effects contributed by the different substituents on these functional groups. In fact, the way that they're drawn on the screen are in order of increasing activity. And hopefully you can see that this is true for a variety of reasons. So again, the reactivity is increasing as you go from the bottom to the top. Notice that an acid halide, like an acid chloride, actually has a good leaving group. So these halides are typically considered to be good leaving groups. Additionally, this nitrogen contains a lone pair, which can actually contribute to the resonance stabilized form of this structure. So therefore, this carbonyl carbon is gonna be less electrophilic. Whereas something like an anhydride has carbonyl groups that are gonna be more electrophilic and more susceptible Susceptible to nucleophilic attack. That nucleophilic attack is actually called nucleophilic acyl substitution. So you can consider a nucleophile coming in and attacking the electrophilic carbonyl carbon. This is going to push the pi electrons up to the oxygen atom, giving us a brand new tetrahedral carbon where we have a negatively charged oxygen atom and the chlorine is still there, as well as the nucleophile. So now, when these pi electrons come back down, what is gonna happen is the better leaving group is gonna be the substituent that gets kicked off, which is why those acid halides are the most reactive, because in fact, they contain a very good leaving group in those halides, which allows us to do this nucleophilic acyl substitution. Now, most of these carboxylic acid derivatives undergo some version of that nucleophilic acyl substitution. However, we need to consider the relative leaving group ability when we're performing these reactions to see if they would actually occur. So consider a reaction where you have water, which contains lone pairs of electrons, which can attack this carbonyl carbon, kicking up the pi electrons, allowing us to generate that tetrahedral carbon where now there's a negative charge that's been built up on the oxygen atom. We're still left with our methoxy group, and then we also have our OH2. Now notice that this is gonna be positively charged, which means that this is an actual really good leaving group. So this means when this comes down, instead of kicking off the methoxy group, it's actually just gonna kick off the water again. Basically a net zero reaction where nothing occurs and you're left with the same starting material. However, we can circumvent this issue if we consider a reaction that actually takes place under acidic conditions. So if we have acidic conditions, then that means that we have a proton that can first protonate one of these carbon or oxygen substituents that contain lone pairs. And this is going to allow us to drive the reaction forward to actually allow us to produce a substitution reaction in which we replace a methoxy group with an alcohol or turning an ester into a carboxylic acid. Now let's try some practice problems to gauge your understanding. Pause the video, try these problems independently, then resume the video to check my solutions. The first step in this reaction is gonna be protonation of the carbonyl oxygen using whatever acid you have in your solution. So you get a protonation, which gives us a positively charged oxygen atom on that carbonyl allowing for this transformation to occur. Remember that in order to change esters, we need to use acidic conditions for this reason. From here, we know that ethanol 
contains lone pairs, which can attack the carbonyl carbon, kicking up the pi electrons to that oxygen atom, allowing us to make that neutral while leaving behind a species that is positively charged on ethanol and still leaving our methoxy group there as well. Since there is other ethanol still present in this solution, that means that there is a nucleophilic position, lone pair, at this oxygen, which can come and deprotonate the ethanol species, allowing us to generate a neutral compound. So now we're gonna be left with our alcohol here. We have a methoxy group here and an ethoxy group here. In doing so, we're actually creating a positively charged species, or another acid, which now contains a proton, which can actually protonate the oxygen on the methoxy group. So this is gonna regenerate neutral ethanol and create a species which is positively charged, making it a better leaving group. So now we have a hydrogen on that methoxy portion, and we have our ethoxy portion, which is neutral. And from here, these lone pairs can move down and will kick off the good leaving group, which is gonna be that protonated methoxy group, allowing us to generate almost our final piece, which now has the ethoxy portion of this F ester. So we've replaced the methoxy portion with the ethoxy portion by making the methoxy portion a good leaving group. And then from here, you just get deprotonation using any nucleophile, and now allowing us to generate our final product. In this question, you were told that you're starting with hexanoyl chloride and you had excess ethylamine. We know that ethylamine contains a nucleophilic lone pair at nitrogen, and we also know that this acid halide or this acid chloride contains a good leaving group. That means that we can undergo nucleophilic acyl substitution, allowing us to kick off those pi electrons to make a negatively charged oxygen species with three lone pairs on it. And now we have created this tetrahedral carbon, which has the positively charged nitrogen, as well as the rest of the molecule. And we have this chloride, which can now function as a good leaving group. So when these pi electrons come back down to reform that carbonyl carbon, rather than kicking off the nitrogen-containing group, this is actually going to kick off the chloride. So in doing so, this allows us to generate an intermediate, which is going to contain that protonated amine, which again is still positively charged. And then from here, we have our chloride, which can actually come back and deprotonate that hydrogen, allowing us to generate our final product, which is what we were trying to make. And that is the new amide bond that's been formed, the new amide bond, which looks like this. In the retrosynthetic analysis of this ester compound, we need to identify which carboxylic acids were used to form this molecule. So for that, we can use, for example, the breakage point at which these are separated. So I see that at this point, in order to generate this ester, we could have used an alcohol that just contained that benzene ring on it, or phenol, if you remember the nomenclature for benzene derivatives. And then also I see that there could have been a carboxylic acid that looked like this, and these two molecules could come together to form this final product. So we have the benzoic acid and the phenol, and under the right conditions, these could combine, and this is how we actually produce esters. If you enjoyed today's video, make sure to subscribe to my channel. And if you have any questions related to this content or anything else related to chemistry, drop it as a comment down below and I'll be happy to help you out. I'll see you in the next video.